Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday of the 30th week of Ordinary Time. So happy to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. We're glad that you are here. And uh, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have one challenging gospel here today. So let's begin. Uh, let's recollect our minds and hearts. Let's open our hearts to this God of ours so we might hear what he has to say to us today and ask him now for his mercy. Lord Jesus, you call us to a whole new life in the Spirit. Lord, have mercy. You call us to follow you. Christ, have mercy. You call us to enter through the narrow gate. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase our faith, hope, and charity. And make us love what you command so that we may merit what you promise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the Spirit who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The word of the Lord. With delight I rejoice in Answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes that I may not sleep in death. Lest my enemy say I have overcome him. Lest my foes rejoice at my downfall. With delight I rejoice. Oh 
Though I trusted in your mercy Let my heart rejoice in your salvation Let me sing of the Lord He has been good to me With delight be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He answered them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house had arisen and locked the door, then you will stand outside knocking and say, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you come from. And you will say, we ate and drank in your company and taught in your streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself cast outside. The people will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and recline a table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when I read the scriptures, there is one question I've always asked for a clear and definitive answer to. And that question is, what does Jesus mean when he says, strive to enter through the narrow gate? And now that I'm supposed to somehow be able to articulate that for you, we'll see how well I do with that, um, makes it doubly challenging for me to come up with an explanation. If you uh, have more questions about all this, once I get done, you're welcome to ask. And um, uh, um, hopefully I'll do an okay job so you can get this a little bit better. What does Jesus mean by that? And by the way, before I start to do that, you'll notice he does not answer the question, how many will be saved or who will be saved? He doesn't answer that question. He never does, never does. But then he says, try to enter through the narrow gate. Now, let me begin this way. And by the way, my um, source is Ruth Burroughs in her book called To Believe in Jesus. And uh, she's a chapter in here, not a long one, but a chapter called Entering Through the Narrow Gate. And she's going to be my source in all of this. Now, traditionally, and I'm going to go back to John the Cross and Teresa of Avila, uh, the great mystics of uh, uh, the uh, church in the 1500s that are still the standard here today, talk, this, uh, talk about three stages of the spiritual life. Uh, traditionally known as the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive stage of the spiritual life. Uh, Ruth Burroughs calls them uh, three islands of the spiritual life, but she agrees with these three basic stages of what the spiritual life is all about. And the first stage, the purgative stage, she says, is is, uh, typified or, or articulated well for us in Jesus's encounter with Nicodemus, in the Gospel of John. He goes to Jesus at night. He makes a kind of a primordial act of faith. But as you hear this, Nicodemus doesn't really get Jesus that much. He's in the beginning of his spiritual life. 
Uh, he has to lay aside many of his preconceived notions about God. He has to become like a child, which means he has to learn to risk and trust God. He has to get rid of the notion that somehow he can earn his own salvation. This would be thoughts of someone in the more purgative stage of the spiritual life. And Ruth Burroughs says this about that part. She says, he is still trapped in the sphere of the flesh. And by flesh, uh, uh, and flesh can never attain God. In the word flesh, there is no suggestion of body as distinct from spirit. What is meant is man as he is in himself, left to his own resources, or rather choosing to depend on his own resources, for God is always offering to take this over. Jesus impresses on this great man his complete helplessness in the things of God. You cannot control the wind or predict its movements. Neither can you be in control of the Spirit. You have to surrender to his control. Nicodemus has to die to his own life, be born again. Otherwise, he will never enter the kingdom. So this would be a statement typifying this purgative stage of the spiritual life. Now, that brings me to the illuminative stage, the second stage. This is all important to Ruth Burroughs and all important to this understanding because uh, she would say that entering the narrow gate is entering into this illuminative stage of the spiritual life. Now, I quote her again when she says, um, this is the second stage, true discipleship. Intentional discipleship. Really, I, I mean, I'm not kidding around anymore. This is, this is what I do. Now, she goes on to say, The gate stands open before us, and no power can swing it shut. But each of us has to choose to walk through the gate. Enter by the narrow gate. The gate is narrow, and the way is hard. That leads to life, and those who find it are few. Hmm. She goes on to say, If they are few... It is not because what is asked is beyond their strength or ability, but because the gate is narrow. To pass through it, one must be small, unencumbered. Much must be left behind. And this much, she's talking about here, really means no more of our own self-importance. We, it, 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 it's, it, we can only pass through. We let go of a lot of stuff. The second stage means that we finally surrender ourselves to God in a real way. It, it, we surrender ourselves to God uh, uh, gradually, slowly, but we've made the initial really true surrender of God. We, we have become childlike. We have begun to really risk and trust God in different things. And gradually, slowly, that'll begin as we continue to enter through the narrow gate. And, and the biggest thing is we're no longer centers of the universe. The purgative stage, I'm still the center of the universe. I just want to get God to do my will. Now, I'm, I'm out of the center, and, and God really is the center of my universe. Uh, this is entering through the narrow gate. And finally, Ruth Burroughs says this, Unless we pass through the gate, we will never realize our destiny. So I, I, I oftentimes wonder, what are we fooling around for? Why, why isn't the deepest desire of our lives is to enter this narrow gate. Why are we fussing around and ducking and dodging God and always trying to find the easy way out of all this? Why don't we not really give it everything we have to enter through the narrow gate? Because, as she says, unless we pass through the gate, we'll never realize our destiny, never achieve our goal, which is eternal life. If we do not pass through it in our mortal life, through it, in physical death, for there is no other way to God. Let me say it again. If we do not pass through it in our mortal life, we pass through it in physical death. I need to say it a little bit better. For there is no other way to God. There is no other way to God than through this narrow gate. That's what Jesus is saying to us today. I hope in some small way I have helped you to be able to grasp that. And here's my two questions for today. First of all, does any of this make sense to you at all of understanding the narrow gate? And number two, more importantly, have you entered through the narrow gate? 
God bless you and glad to be with you here today. Uh, guest speaker tomorrow. Can't wait to see who it is myself, even though I kind of know. Uh, and I'll see you again on Friday. Bye-bye now.